of the spring. My name is Dan Fagan. I'm a professor of journalism here at the Carter Institute of Journalism at NYU. Uh, and I'm the director of the Science, Health, and Environmental Reporting Program and also the Science Communication Workshops uh, at NYU. Uh, both of which are aimed at improving the quality and also the quantity, if possible, uh, of uh, science communication, science journalism uh, floating around. We're addressing a really important and rather cool, but also sometimes scary uh, topic today with uh, gene editing and, and CRISPR-Cas9 in particular. Uh, I will leave the formal introduction to uh, Lee Holtz, but just say for now that we have two fantastic guests and I'm very grateful to both of them for, for coming, uh, Antonio and Sam. And Antonio in particular is a proud graduate of our program, at least we're proud of him. I, I hope he's proud of us. Uh, <laughs> Uh, and a fantastic journalist, and a, of course, Sam wrote an, an important book with Jennifer Dudna and is himself uh, an important uh, CRISPR researcher and thinker. So we're, we're grateful to have them both, and as always, our uh, ringmaster is Robert Lee Holtz, uh, science writer at the Wall Street Journal and a distinguished writer in residence at NYU. So Lee, please take it away. Thank you, Professor Fagan. So welcome to the Cavalier Conversations on Science Communication. Uh, as some of you may know, I see familiar faces. Our purpose is to dig into how we tell the story of science, how scientists and journalists, each on our own side of the fence and each in our own way, strive to convey complex new research to the general public. Now, this is the first of four Cavalier Conversations that we will be hosting this spring. On March 21st, we'll focus on the use and abuse of brain imaging with Yale University psychiatrist Sally uh, Sattel and award-winning reporter J.B. McKinnon. On April 25th, uh, we'll be looking at how science has distorted gender uh, with gender studies pioneer Anne Fausto Sterling and Angela Saini, who is author of a new book called Inferior. How Science Got Women Wrong. And then on April 25th, we will be exploring the future of wilderness on a tamed planet with nature writer Emma Maris and conservation biologist uh, Joe Roman. Now, just to uh, repeat uh, what Dan said, these conversations are sponsored by the Cavalier Foundation and the NYU Science, Health, Environment, and Reporting Program uh, under the leadership of Dan Fagan. As we go, uh, I want to encourage our audience here to offer their questions at the microphone over there. And uh, those of you who are watching this online, you can tweet your questions to us using the hashtag CavalierConvo. Now, we take for our text tonight an unusually convoluted and important saga of 21st century biology, the story of CRISPR-Cas9, perhaps the most powerful gene editing technology of our time. Now, it uh, promises, uh, depending on who you talk to, a kind of magic wand that can be waved over many um, of our ills, and certainly uh, uh, it promises the opportunity to transform the human race as deftly as it can rearrange the genome of a common mushroom. And importantly for our purpose tonight, um, it highlights the struggle for control of a public narrative of science. For as this story has unfolded, uh, scientists at the center have constructed contesting histories uh, to influence not only who might get what seems to be like a, a sure thing Nobel Prize um, for this discovery, but also the uh, financial gains that may be reaped for individuals and in particular institutions from the patents uh, for CRISPR applications which are mightily in dispute. Now, we are joined uh, by two leading lights of this conversation. Uh, on my immediate right, um, Antonio Regalando, who is Senior Editor for Biomedicine at MIT's Technology Review. Uh, he is an NYU native. 
Uh, his mother and father were both NYU professors, and uh, he really grew up here, and as uh, Dan has mentioned, he trained uh, in science journalism at what then was SERP under partially the tutelage of Stephen Hall and Gary Taubes, uh, who were teaching here then. Uh, he actually majored in physics at Yale, though, and uh, he has, I may say, raced up the ladder of journalism from Science Magazine to the Wall Street Journal, where he and I were colleagues for a while, to now MIT Technology Review, where in recent years he's chronicled the ups and downs and uh, 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 perils and promise of uh, CRISPR-Cas9. And then here we have uh, uh, Sam Sternberg, the co-author of this excellent book. Um, he is a protein RNA chemist uh, and um, an expert and one of the several uh, progenitors of CRISPR-Cas9 in a scientific pedigree sort of way. Um, and he is a newly arrived assistant professor in the Department of Biochemistry and Molecular Biophysics at our uh, neighbors up the street at Columbia University. He did his doctoral research in the laboratory of CRISPR pioneer Jennifer Doudna. Doudna. And, Doudna. Doudna, thank you. Sorry. Uh, it's all right. Uh, and he wrote with her, he co-authored with her um, this book, A Crack in Creation, about the discovery, development, and application of CRISPR-Cas9 gene editing. So to give it its due, the New York Review of Books calls this an even-handed guidebook to the CRISPR revolution that gives equal weight to the science of CRISPR and to the profound ethical questions that it raised. Uh, the book, quote, is required reading for every concerned citizen, unquote. And Sam also was co-author of an article in Science that has proposed a moratorium on editing the human germline using this technology until safety and societal implications are more broadly discussed. And we'll do a little bit of that here tonight. Um, I feel that at the outset here, because of the broader um, dimensions in which this uh, uh, takes place, that I, that I need to, to get you to acknowledge uh, your constraints up front. So. Um, Antonio, you write for the MIT Technology Review. MIT is one of the institutions that has a, a dog in this fight, that it'd be easy for a, a reader to think that uh, in your coverage you are simply um, uh, offering the point of view of, a, of, a, of a, an aggressive university that's seeking to defend its share of uh, patent and licensing revenues. Um, is that fair? Well, I get, let me just answer the question, like what, what is off limits for me? It's the stories yet to be told. Um, I don't want to preview those here. And there may be even some CRISPR stories that can't be told, which is interesting to think about. Um, as far as MIT goes, uh, Technology Review is a kind of a strange type of magazine uh, published by a university, but editorially independent. Um, and lucky for me, uh, so is the Broad Institute. Um, the Broad Institute is where the sort of East Coast side of the CRISPR story is based, and they are also an independent organization affiliated with MIT. Um, so I'm going to say that it's the independence of the Broad Institute, which has kind of uh, taken off the shackles for me, ah. I'm covering CRISPR. Okay. okay. So you feel unbridled? I'm willing to throw the rider. <laughs> Well said, sir. Okay. So in a, in a way, let me uh, put the same question to you, Sam, just so we have our boundary conditions set. Um, this is the excellent book, is, uh, among other things, go in, goes into the creation story in some detail of how this worked out in the lab in which you worked. Um, this had to go through a kind of legal review, yeah, so it didn't uh, conflict with a legal position that was being taken. Can you just... Yeah, I mean, obviously there's an ongoing patent dispute that I'm not a part of, but, but Berkeley certainly is, so there was a bit of overview. Um, you know, the book tells Jennifer's story, not my story, and, you know, we don't try to, to, to tell anything other than how Jennifer experienced her lab's work on, on how CRISPR-Cas9 was, was initiated in the lab and how she worked together with Emmanuel Charpentier. And, you know, obviously there's some political weight with putting out this book at this time, but I remember very distinctly when Jennifer and I first sat down and talked about this idea, and at that time it was 
before the entire patent mess had ever mm -hmm. erupted. And you know, I think very sincerely we had a, an innocent desire to share the story with a much broader community before it was even clear that there would be New, York, New Yorker articles or MIT tech cover stories or New York Times articles. I mean, this was back in, geez, 2013 when you know, the first big papers had come out harnessing CRISPR in human tissues, human cells. Um, but we felt like the story of where this even comes from, that it's from these, these bacterial immune systems that you know, are often forgotten. That was really the story that we wanted to bring to light and make sure it's told in a very public way and, and really celebrate some of that basic research, that those basic scientific investigations that I think really made this entire revolution possible. So let's um, linger with that for a second. So if I may, so at that moment, um, uh, you were a postdoc. Um, PhD student. PhD student. Okay, I, I guess I had the idea that you were starting to look for your first uh, tenure track position somewhere in there. You were starting to think about how to go on, and yet you took a year off, if you like, to put it that way. You stepped aside from like kind of a normal uh, scientific track to sort of write this, um, and not write it in your voice. I mean, you're you're a, what we would call a ghost writer in a sense. So you have your name on the title there as, as well you deserve. But I mean, you know, why on earth would a, would a, a, a sensible, well-educated, uh, apparently sane um, uh, a PhD uh, about to launch himself into the job market decide to take such a detour? Well, the job market was, was further into the future. I wasn't quite there yet. Um, I guess it was the dream to be able to be on a stage like this and talk about having contributed to this kind of a project that I figured was probably not gonna come along again anytime soon. Um, I mean, as I think you very carefully pointed out, I'm not a discoverer of CRISPR-Cas9. I think, you know, I, I have a very a unique insight having mm -hmm. been in Jennifer's lab and worked on CRISPR years before most of the world knew what CRISPR was. You know, I can remember going to conferences in 2009 to an RNA Society conference. I mean, CRISPR is celebrated as something that uses a very powerful RNA molecule for this targeting capability. And even at an RNA conference full of about a thousand scientists, I was the only person with an abstract on CRISPR. So this was really huh. a, a niche field, not just in, I mean, it didn't exist in biotechnology yet, but even within protein RNA biology, CRISPR was something that maybe a few dozen people were really studying. Um, so where was I coming from? Right. So. Honestly, I wasn't thinking about the job. I figured this is a, a rare opportunity, and you know, we had gotten Jennifer had gotten contacted by an agent in New York who, when he sent us the email and he had his client list at the bottom, it had you know Steven Pinker and, and some of my other like science writing idols. So you actually had a, an agent uh, reach out to you, Brockman, to Jennifer. Brockman. Oh well, that's yes, Brockman. That's the part that we all kind of struggle with is trying to get yeah, someone, I mean, obviously, someone's <laughs> yeah, attention. Right, exactly. So I, I was very spoiled through Jennifer because someone came to her asking if there was interest in a book and having made a bunch of jokes to her over the years about writing a New Yorker piece together, or you know, I was just dreaming at the time, and they were mostly jokes, but I thought. This is a story that has the kind of narrative and um, eureka type moments that you can really bring to a general reader audience um, because of both where it came from and how far away that was for where it ended up and the fact that what are the real implications here? Well, it's rewriting the human genome. I mean, obviously in the, the subtitle of the book, even though it's, it was a little more extreme than I initially wanted to go for, you know, that's really capturing, I think, what the possibilities are. And um, so I think, it was a unique opportunity to have an agent express interest from their end. But as we talked about on the phone the other day, I mean, we didn't. Yeah, yeah he, he dropped you like a hot potato, <laughs> right? Well, the first yeah, proposal you know, didn't I mean, got passed on. So uh, that, right. you know, that was part of the, right. the, the journey for getting this, this book published was figuring out the right way to, to sell the story or to pitch the story. Um, the first version didn't have the, the writing in Jennifer's voice, we were, uh, at that time, I, of course, wanted my own voice to come through a bit, so we, we used uh, first person plural. We were writing in we. Um, some things were kind of Jennifer's experiences. Some were more mine. Some were we as scientists. Some were we as society members. And, and in the end, I think that didn't work because there, you didn't have that intimacy with the, with the writer. Who are you really hearing from? 
So I think that was one of the problems. It was also a little bit academic. I mean, we started the, the pitch with an allusion to um, Kuhn's structures of a scientific revolution. Oh, there's a barn which, burner. <laughs> yeah, I remember reading that in uh, you know, at Columbia, we have this core curriculum, and I think mm -hmm. the second year we read that as part of the kind of philosophy course. And that was eye-opening for me, and I thought, man, that's gonna be a great hook. But <laughs> what kind of person on the street is gonna read about Kuhn and get into that, right? So I think by the time the second proposal came around, the, the hook for the agency was, was an experience I had where I was sitting down in a um, Mexican restaurant in Berkeley hearing this kind of fairly crazy woman pitch me on the idea of a company to provide CRISPR as a product to uh, future parents. And this was before the first monkey, you know, CRISPR modified monkeys had even right. been born. I mean, this was, this was like, yes, we had done gene, you know, researchers had done gene editing in mice, but this was so far before this, this idea of actually marketing CRISPR as a tool for choosing genetic traits in your future children was mm -hmm. something that a, so, a legitimate person should be thinking about. But there I was sitting across the table yeah. from her, and she was dangling the word co-founder to me. So I th you know, this was the, the new hook was, imagine a world where you're going to have people that want to do this. And it's going to be possible. Yeah. It'll be technically feasible. So you felt an obligation then as a, as a researcher to take this conversation, take this uh, to the public? I mean, that's something yeah. that I have felt very privileged that I will be invited to um, events like this or, you know, uh -huh. other speaking events to, you know, audiences that are not scientists well, because I do really believe in the a lot, courts a of lot of A lot of young scientists uh, wrestle with this. And thing. my PhD, I, please. No, please. So, but I wonder um, from the other side, Antonio, you know, here's a, uh, a new very powerful, much hyped, uh, perhaps well deserved, but much hyped uh, uh, new scientific development, new technology. I mean, where's the journalist's proper spot in this? What's your, well, actually, how do you see your role? Are you, are you cheerleader? Are you a uh, challenger? Are you referee? I mean, are you advocate? I mean, where, where do you, where do you go? He, he likes, he likes the idea he might get a, a place on our podium. He likes the idea. He's going to be able. No, I'm no, I'm, no, I'm giving you a hard time, but that's my job uh, here. Um, and an opportunity to speak directly to the public about this, to bypass Antonio and me. Um, I, the, the, the answer is. Where are you? The, the correct answer is that you know it's all in the public interest. Uh, the personal answer is the truth is. Uh, well, we'll accept more, the truth. <laughs> breaking, breaking news about technology is just where I get my dopamine, okay? Yeah. And what's so interesting about Sam's story is actually my CRISPR journey actually starts in the same place as his with the same person who's called Christine in this book. She's given a, a suit on you, you, you met her? I, I know her. I know ah. her. I never wrote about her for different okay. reasons. We'll find out why Sam gave her a pseudonym and didn't name her. Um, <laughs> That was the but advice of legal representation, it, just it, to make <laughs> things easy. The fact there is, are a lot of lawyers in this story. I, could think I, I only started start. writing about CRISPR. I'd been covering business. I got shifted mm -hmm. to the biology beat in mid-2014. And so um, one article that I read was actually in, um, on a website called The Information, which covers more technology. But they, they did this interview with a very strange person uh, who later committed suicide, Austin Hines. Yep who is a kind of a head of a do-it-yourself biology kind of coven, Cam I would Cambrian say. Cambrian genomics. Yeah. Yep. And he, one of the things that he did that was wrong is that he would kind of talk about other people's projects. And so they did an interview with him where he was the one to first articulate in an enthusiastic way about how wouldn't it be great if for just very little money you could just change living things, um, change animals, change people. And, and in that article, he mentioned this, this company it was called Healthy Happy Baby. That's healthy, what it was. Right. Happy Baby. Happy, right. happy Healthy Baby. Happy, happy Healthy healthy, I always baby. get it backwards. Which I also happy. wanted to put in the book, but also we were advised not to, just to okay. protect well, the company. You, you tell us what your reasons for, for not telling, um, not, not naming the names. Anyway, so that yeah. was actually my, <laughs> my, my first choice, exposure yeah. to it. So yeah. th these people were a little bit, that was your choice? No, it was but not, okay. that was following the advice of people above me. I mean, I, Lawyers? The publishers. I okay. mean, they just felt it was smarter. In any case, I mean, these people had a kind of a crazy idea. They were in San Francisco. They didn't really have a company, but they were articulating something. 
which was that this was suddenly going to be possible and some people are going to want to do it, just like is written in the book. And so then what I did was I just went and found, I went back to the sort of scientific literature. Um, I actually went to people in animal genetics because I figured that they were the ones who were already going to be doing it to pigs and cows. And if it was possible, then I would learn that it would be possible to change the germline and that I might find the people actually doing their early experiments in the human germline engineering. So um, I just think it's funny that we had the same starting point. So cool. Um, and then our paths intersect again. Um, when Technology Review did a story about human germline engineering, we put it on the cover. And um, for that story, it was great to find out that Sam and Jennifer Dowden and some other people had had a big meeting, the Cecilmar meeting, mm -hmm. in which uh, they discussed it. So for me, it was just a journey of just finding out what was going on and putting it in print. I mean, it's that simple. And that was a huge scoop. I mean, that, I remember that story very, very distinctly. Uh, you know, I followed Antonio's work very closely, and as we joked before we started, I don't know how many references there are to Antonio's pieces in the book, but I mean, I remember that piece, the cover, the scoop, because I mean, we had just had that meeting, and we were putting together this white paper that was published in Science, but you know, your thing came out, um, I think, just before that, and that was fantastic research, and actually, just to share one more kind of um, star-studded story about you, you know, I remember when I was just first starting the book, I bought some of these textbooks on scientific writing, and I remember you had a chapter in one of these about investigative journalism. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I forget which book it was, but seeing your name there and then connecting it with the person that had the scoop about, about germline editing, it was, it was very cool for Field me. Field guide for yeah, science no, yeah. writers. I didn't end up. 2002 edition, I think. <laughs> yeah. But you've got a reader, all right. This is, uh, so is, I have to sh 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 ask the French, so is he, your, is he a source of yours? Um, Sam, are you a source? Uh, sometimes, like we have a Twitter direct message. Yeah, thing. has he leaked anything uh, good? I'm just kind of, you know. No, I, I, think no? I feel like it's more scolding, more, more of a scolding ah, uh, thing. Ah, I see. Uh, I correct me, because I'm often wrong, um, so they the kind of need to be, you know. I think sometimes scientists help me. The biggest scoop is like pointing Antonio to more examples of left-handed DNA helices, which I've learned yeah, right. is like one of Antonio's pet peeves. DNA can be drawn two different ways. One is the correct way. One is actually the mirror image that doesn't exist in nature. And Antonio is the guy to pick this up in like popular science images. Right. It, it doesn't exist in nature, but it exists in a surprising number of magazines yes. and newspapers. Yes. In really fact, the first, the first <laughs> version of the book cover, um, which was never my favorite, that's something that was a fun experience. To, I mean, not to knock on the publisher, but Anyway, the first version of the, the front cover didn't have any DNA on it. Then they added the helix, and it was the wrong mirror image. And I was immediately like, no, that's got to change. If that comes out the wrong way, that'll be the biggest embarrassment. Right, because Antonio will be DMing you about it. <laughs> they, built a, they built a tower in Moscow called the Evolution Tower. It's a helix, and it goes the wrong way. And I say, well, you can't undo that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I want to understand just a little bit more, if I may, for a moment about your process in the voice. Because mm. I think the voice, while it may make uh, a commercial sense, I think to people like Antonio and I, it can be, it's sometimes confusing to know exactly who's talking and how, how much we're being actually brought in mm. to a process. So I wonder if you would just tell us a little bit about this collaboration. I mean, how did this actually work? Well, just like the one, the f one funny follow-up to that is, we had a, a book review in Nature that was not the most exalting. I mean, it was like somewhat critical, and I got one mention, and it was a parenthetical that the co-author Sam Sternberg's voice never comes out, and we don't know what he did really. Um, yeah, I mean, so, so I guess under the circumstances, that was a compliment. No, no, it wasn't. No. A compliment. <laughs> okay. So bring us into that a little bit. I mean, you yeah, I mean, so uh, I took the lead in drafting a large portion of the book, um, but I mean, it really was a team effort. Well, I'm sorry. When you say you took a a large uh, uh, role in drafting a portion of major portion of the book, does that mean you sort of like wrote chapters and then took it to your collaborator and say, "Is this what you meant?" Um, uh, we had. This, I mean, early I mean, on, we had. I mean, I know Jennifer very well. Yeah. We we developed a very close working relationship over the years. We wrote a bunch of science articles together. Um, so I think we developed a real understanding of our writing style and of how we think about both the material and the ways to frame it. 
So before we did any writing, we, we had a number of meetings where we kind of discussed um, the outline of the book. She had this really um, attractive kind of analogy for how to think about the book of you know having these different vignettes and each one is kind of sitting on a card and you really just need to figure out the way to put them all together in a way that tells the story. So we, you know, we kind of drafted that story together in terms of how we're going to go through the different aspects of CRISPR, both the, some of the early work in her lab, some of the work that preceded work in her lab, mm -hmm. and then obviously all the applications, which to the majority have happened outside of her lab. I mean, she, mm -hmm. I think, her and Emmanuel and others get credit for, for some of the early work discovering or describing how this Cas9 enzyme works. But I mean, you talk about the work in agriculture, the work in, in, mm -hmm. um, in doing genome-wide screens in mammalian cells, work in mice, work in pigs and cows. That's all happening all over the world. You know? You know, I understand. But so who's talking when it says, I did this, I did that? Thighs, Jennifer. Yeah. There are some stories in there mm -hmm. that, you know, she talks about her, her dying father. She talks about, right. um, you know, her life in Hawaii a couple times. Did you times. interview her? How did this those, work? Some of those she wrote. Um, okay. Some things we had, I, mean, I had some Skype meetings with mm -hmm. her when I wasn't in Berkeley where mm -hmm. I would be taking notes or recording and then convert some of that into text. Um, I'd say a lot of the, the background and the scientific framework for the birth of gene editing um, the work that was done in the lab. I mean, I know that stuff inside out from the lab. I did, I read a lot of books and did some background reading on putting that into a framework. And I drafted a lot of that. Um, but so the voice is, is hers. Some things were written more by me, some things she wrote, some things we wrote together. Mm -hmm. Everything was approved by both authors. Well, that's only fair. So when an author writes a book or a journalist writes a story, of course, there's a story that they're trying to, to tell, and, and then there's a, a story that readers are trying to get, and mm -hmm. they're often not the same thing. And it is a conscious choice here, and I I'm, I'm want to ask Antonio about this. When you, um, to kind of leave business out, um, and for those of you who don't know, one of the things that happened very quickly um, as uh, uh, CRISPR-Cas9 sort of demonstrated its worth in the laboratory. A number of companies were formed that attracted a great deal of venture capital money. Um, those companies have since gone public. Well, the, several of them have. Uh, and um, there's a, a great uh, uh, marketing energy. There's a great uh, uh, cyclone of capitalism circulating around this. And so from your standpoint, he wants this to be a science story, nice story about how things work and the possible ramifications to our ethical and moral concerns about our biology. But the tech review, do you, is that how you see it? Is this also a business story? How do you approach that? Uh, it is actually my first interaction with, I don't remember if Sam was involved, probably not, but with Jennifer Doudna was sort of shortly before this kind of germline uh, or designer baby issue arose. Well, no, but how, bring us in. Maybe we don't know about the designer baby issue. I mean, explain to our audience. The designer baby issue? Oh, well, simply that the, the book is actually half, half, half of the book is, is a kind of a primer on everything that led up to um, the invention of CRISPR editing technology. And then sort of the second half of the book is essentially, I'm talking about your book, but it Please. is, yeah, yeah. But it, it is, as I read it, uh, Sam and Jennifer's concerns about where this technology is going to go, specifically, uh, whether we're going to be able to change the, the genetic makeup of people and essentially sort of be the authors of evolution. Mm -hmm. um, and indeed, there are it. human embryo experiments underway. There are speak. human embryo experiments underway. But that's only part of the story. And the other part of the story is the business story. And I'm curious. Right. So before the, this question of the, of the designer babies came up, the issue of the patent came up. In December of 2014, we wrote an article which just kind of disclosed for the first time, I think, um, the patent fight that is going on, it has been going on between the Broad Institute at, at, of MIT and Harvard and Sam's old institution, Berkeley. And so it just turned out that there was a very bitter fight for, for control over the patent rights and sort of implicitly the discovery rights. Uh, who gets to say they're, they're the discoverer or the inventor of this? Um, patents are one way to do that, and so um, 
Jennifer Doudna has not uh, wanted to address it in her book. She didn't really address it in the book, um, even though I think it does take up a lot of time and mental energy. So it was interesting. Why did you leave it out? Maybe you can let us know. But uh, certainly it was definitely newsworthy. Um, both of the reasons that, you know, how much is the patent worth? I can't say. A billion dollars, potentially. Um, but also then this, the issue of credit, of scientific credit, which to me has got to burn even brighter than the money. It is not unusual in modern biology for someone who has developed uh, or discovered a particularly potentially useful commercial process to form a company. Government policies have been put in place since the 1980s to encourage everyone to do this. Um, but what's interesting about this is that there are almost as many companies as there are people who were involved in this process. Um, and. Uh, I meant to look up what they were trading at uh, today, but uh, I can tell you that yesterday, CRISPR Therapeutics, which was founded by Emmanuel uh, Charpentier, who was one of the uh, early uh, uh, pioneers in this, is you know is trading at around forty-nine, fifty dollars a share. Intelia Therapeutics, which is now uh, a con company, is trading around twenty-seven, thirty dollars. Um, I mean, it goes on. Editas, which is the Road uh, uh, instance trading, you know, even uh, higher. I mean, it just is hard for those of us who, on either side here, are trying to take to the public a story that is so thoroughly distorted by licensing and patenting issues. And um, there is the example in this case of. Um, the Broad Institute to the vehicle of Eric Lander in Cell uh, decided to sit down and write his version of the history of, of, uh, of this development, which for reasons you could probably get in an argument with him about, but, but just seemed to sort of conveniently leave some people out and right. not you, other people. You asked me before, since, yeah. since I worked for MIT, which actually no, is a co-owner of one set of the patents, how I deal with it, and my approach is just a pox on both your houses, right? I think you uh -huh. know, sometimes you know, the story's gone up and down, but both these universities, both Berkeley and the Broad Institute, you know, they, they've deployed the patents in a way that doesn't reflect, I don't think, the spirit of this book, like humanity mm -hmm. first, what does this mean for, for, for everyone? The patents were licensed exclusively to themselves. Jennifer Doudna licensed it exclusively, or the patent application to her startup company, Caribou, and on, on the same instance, the Broad Institute licensed it exclusively to a startup that had its own faculty uh, you know, as the co-founders. So it wasn't sort of made open um, to everybody. I mean, a platform technology in general amongst universities, you license it to all comers. You know, everybody can have a share of this. But instead, it was, they were, the, fi the fight over control is, is, is in a sense because they license it exclusively to their own companies by which they've profited before CRISPR has even benefited anybody. These companies went public, so somebody can share, sell their shares. You know, it's, it's pay me now, and we'll give you the benefits of this technology uh, sometime in the future. Okay, so now as a science journalist covering this, when you are writing um, about the, the hope, the promise, um, the potential power, um, is your coverage tempered by that realization? Um, it is in the sense that we, you have to cover the commercial side. I said before that I believe that you know, the issue of credit, of, of just having made a big discovery has got to be more important to people than money. I think I might be naive about that, say I might be able to tell more from the inside. You know, I think people are motivated by um, being involved in, in something big and less so by the money. But there is, you know, it is a lot of money. It's you know, millions or fives of millions um, you know, that are swirling around individuals. So um, I guess I've never really asked them yeah. how much, uh, you know. Let's ask. If, if, if that influences. How do you feel about that? I have, What's your perception? I have zero million swirling around me. <laughs> no, but, but you were, um, for a significant portion of your early career, um, kind of in the middle of this swirl. Well, I'll tell you from the perspective of being in Jennifer's lab, whether you believe it or not, I mean, I would say 
the lab was pretty shielded from all of this stuff going on. Um, I mean, the work that I did on Cas9, like if it seemed like it was a potentially useful tool, yes, we worked with the tech transfer office, we filed applications after the like provision, you know, the foundational mm -hmm. work, but um, we never talked about what we needed to do to lock down. I mean, it was about the science first mm -hmm. and foremost, and I really, I, I can't comment on how Jennifer speaks with, at company meetings with Caribou or with Intelia, I don't know that, but I can say from my perspective being in her lab, I mean, we cared about the science and we cared about learning about how CRISPR works, how we can build different kinds of tools using Cas9 or other enzymes, um, how that can teach us about how bacteria are fighting off viruses. I mean, that was, that really in a, in a real sense was the bubble that my work occurred mm -hmm. within. I mean, obviously I followed all the patent stuff. It's quite interesting for me. Uh, it's a major drama, but that for me personally was never my interest and I'm still pretty, I would say, um, naive about patent things because that's mm -hmm. just not what excites me about CRISPR. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I can see that. As a book author, now, you're operating in an arena where I think there are a number of CRISPR books in play now, right? I mean, that are in, in process, you know, and uh, as a hopeful bestseller, um, the stuff of drama, the stuff of human emotion, the stuff of uh, tension and angst, uh, my editor, whenever I take a long story proposal for them, the first thing they ask is, okay, what's the tension? Uh, you know, who gets hurt? Uh, what's at stake? Um, so when you come to this, as a scientist, you bring a special uh, perspective and a special uh, insight into the technical side. Um, but uh, now if I'm your editor, see, I want to know, well, why are you holding back the human side? Yeah, I, I'm sure in a different time, well, I, I can't speak for Jennifer. I mean, yes, if I, if I were Jennifer and we were writing this book, once the patent issue had been decided, I mean, one of the challenges is on a practical level, this book was published last summer. We submitted the manuscript in September of 2016, which was, I don't know, you probably know way better than I do what the state of the Undecided. interference proceeding was at, but you know, that was in the middle of the motions uh, preceding this interference proceeding, which was basically finding out if the um, patent office would even rule that there is a conflict between the Broad IP and the Berkeley IP. So, I mean, on a practical level, how can we write about any of this when it might be done and Berkeley's won by the time the book comes out, or it might go the exact opposite direction, which is incidentally what happened. But now, of course, it's an appeal, and who knows how many years that's going to drag out if it goes back to interference. Mm. You know, that could now take multiple years mm -hmm. if you're going through all of the documentation to try to argue who actually had the discovery in cells for the first, you know, I mean, that could mm -hmm. be a multi-year process, and I think it just seemed impossible to write about this in a way that would be timely and not immediately dated by the time the book comes out. I'd say we have the same challenges with the technology side and with what's being done research-wise. Also, I mean, I think you introduced this whole topic by mentioning CRISPR-Cas9. Yes. But of course, <laughs> there are many other flavors of CRISPR now. Indeed. This is something Indeed. my lab is interested in studying, mm -hmm. but already we've seen Cas12, Cas13. Both of those have been named different things depending on what year and what mm -hmm. articles you're going to. So, of course, it's challenging to write about something that has happened but is still happening. Um, knowing that you're, it's not like an MIT Tech Review article where you can write the next update to the story so, in a day, you know. So, so you felt you could, you had to kind of grab a, a, a slice of this history um, that had a, a beginning and an end, even though the story, of course, goes on. I should just remind our, our, our uh, audience online, we're talking to Sam Sternberg from Columbia University, the author of this great book, Crack and Creation, and uh, my colleague uh, Antonio Regalado from MIT Technology Review, who has been covering this in some depth for several years, and that if you have questions, you can uh, tweet them to us using the hashtag uh, Cavalier Convo. Let me put the show on the other foot. So, you know, Antonio, I mean, do we just place too much emphasis on 
sort of the human dynamics of these situations and on motive and on, you know, who profits and does that get in the way of actually conveying, you know, the, the nuances and the truth of the science that's actually at stake? Um, there's a part of the I mean, aren't you the problem, Antonio? Yeah. <laughs> there's, a, there's a part in the book where Jennifer and Sam recount how she gets uh, a copy of Jim Wilson's uh, Double Helix. Watson. Uh, give, Watson. Oh, I mean, uh, yeah, excuse yeah. me. That's right. Yeah. Remember Wilson that guy? Remember that guy? More recently. <laughs> yeah, James Watson. <laughs> James Watson's Double Helix um, is given to her by her father, like a dog-eared copy, and, and she reads it. And of course, um, that book is only about that big, and it's all about personalities. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, you know, I think, you know, the questions that I have kind of about this saga are some of the ones that also go unanswered in the book. Like there's some personal things that have happened, personal dynamics, um, personal fights maybe that, that are not clear to me um, and that nobody has kind of revealed what the answer is. They're also not revealed here. So I think that, you know, I think that the, the, the personal part of the story is more important than we know and there's less reporting on it than we could have. I, yes. In more important than we know why? Well, because people haven't said. People haven't said. Ah. How, how does, how does uh, Jennifer Doudna feel about her, um, her co-developer of, of CRISPR? Um, how does she feel about Feng Zhang at the Broad Institute? These, are not, these things are not revealed in the book. Um, she holds them close to her vest, I guess. So, you know, I think these personal dynamics, just as in your life and mine, I think they're incredibly important. And, and we actually even, haven't even heard that side of the story yet. Is that because you haven't asked about it? Well, whereas the patent stuff comes from patent documents. I mean, it overlaps, but it's, it's literally in a bunch yeah. of documents that you can download off the internet, and then you can put that story yeah. together. It's documented. Yeah. And, and, I, and I feel I should explain. I'm exploring this topic, this aspect mm -hmm. of this topic in part because those patent documents um, have drilled down to such a level of personal detail, what so-and-so said to so-and-so in an email about uh, their uncertainty about something, and this is now because of these broader stakes, um, you know, you could say is distorting the story or you could say is clarifying it. I mean, it's really hard to know. Um, do you think that the public, that has a right to know these things about a, an emerging powerful technology like that, that they have a right to know something more about the, the, the roots of the origin story, Sam? I don't think they have a right to know Jennifer's or mine or anyone's personal life. I mean, and I think some of these things have impacted people's personal lives. Um, I'd say as stewards of the technology and of the way that it's made available, I mean, that's something that should be in the public realm, I would agree with that. Um, but I don't think Jennifer should have written about what was going on in her head when X, Y, and Z happened. Maybe that's something she will talk more openly about someday, or Fung, or George, or any of the other players. Um, I'm sure there are really interesting stories there. Uh, and I was very conscious when we were writing the book that people are going to be disappointed because yes, mm -hmm. I mean, you can go to the chapter where it's discussed how the 2012 paper came out and then the 2013 papers and it's pretty dry the way that that's described. I mean, there's a, that's the crux of the dispute and it's like two sentences in the book. So I get it that that's like pretty disappointing if you, mm -hmm. you know, as our reviewer in Nature Magazine wrote, if you're a CRISPR junkie, what a letdown. Um, but you know, we, we had certain constraints just because of the timing and I think because of the, what we wanted this book to be about versus what we didn't want it to be about. There will be other books. I mean, I think Jacob Shirko is writing a book on the intellectual property side of CRISPR. I don't know if you've if you talked with Jacob, but I think there, there are other books that are gonna be written about other facets of CRISPR. I know Michael Spector's book is coming out, I think next year sometime. So I mean, yeah, I think that's, if you, if you think about how people describe the discovery of the DNA double helix today and mm -hmm. what books have been written about it and when did they come out, I mean, there's definitely other books that'll enter the picture and, and other articles and it's interesting to kind of imagine in, in 10 years mm -hmm. 
what's going to be the memorable one. So for. if you were going to describe then for us the slice of this complicated story, of which there'll be many versions, as you just said, I mean, what's, what's, what's the slice, what's the piece of this that you want to be, you know, held responsible for, that you want to be, you want this to be remembered for, that you want this to be the contribution? Well, I could talk about my research, which will put everyone to sleep. Um, <laughs> I mean, you know, my research in Jennifer's lab was really understanding on a detailed level how Cas9, how this machine really works. And I think we were able to use that knowledge and develop a few different variants and also higher fidelity versions of the enzyme, things that will minimize off-target mutations or basically unintended effects of a gene editing experiment in certain cell types. That's work that we just published last year. Um, and then in my future lab, I mean, I'm, you know, earlier I, I alluded to some of these other flavors of CRISPR that don't have a Cas9 at all. And there's already been plenty of work done in this area, but I think, you know, you can look at some articles from a bioinformatician at the NIH looking at the diversity of CRISPR across the microbial domain, and Cas9 is a minority player. We're talking 10 to 20 percent maximum of the versions of CRISPR in nature use Cas9. Most of them are using completely different types of machinery. Um, we know a lot about it, but there's a lot we don't know about. And so, I mean, that's, you know, obviously I'm, I'm starting my lab now, so I have to, I have to be mm -hmm. realistic about what I can mm -hmm. do and what I can work on that's not going to be gobbled up by the bigger players in the, in the, in the field. Um, One, no, sorry, please, no, thanks. And then I was going to say, I mean, you know, with the book, I, I feel humbled every time I, like, hear someone mention it to me because I, you know, I'm not a Jennifer, I'm not a Martin Yannick, I mean, the first, co-first author on the paper, I'm not a Christoph Kalinsky, the other co-first author on the mm -hmm. paper, Prashant Mali, the, you know, there are so many other scientists that were in the lab working on the first developments of Cas9. Mm -hmm. There are plenty of people that should be far more famous than any of us. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, I, I yeah. don't expect well, to be in that mix, but I, I will do what I you know, can so, do. So I've been pushing you hard on the, on the culture of credit, and I appreciate your good humor about it. And that's really about half the book, I mean, what we've just been kind of uh, uh, talking about. The other half, you really, uh, clearly, the two of you felt an obligation to kind of lay out some fairly serious things that you think that all of us ought to be worried about that all of us ought to be thinking about how, um, as citizens, as people who may be affected about this, this is the stuff that should keep us up late at night. And I wonder, Antonio, is, is this valid, do you think, these concerns? Or um, is this something that, that uh, I know that as long as I've been a science journalist, which is quite a long time, I've been um, reading scare stories about designer babies, for instance. Right. Well, this time the scare is real. Ah, okay. <laughs> see. So, okay. I, yeah. Right. I mean, the second part of the book, I, I think, is is very interesting because, as I said, my reporting story intersected with with Sam and and Jennifer Doudna's own efforts to sort of bring this designer baby question to light. Well, open and that so up I a little bit. What did you do? I just I, I just found out that they had this meeting. They had a meeting in um, January of 2015, I guess, in California. It was modeled on sort of on the Asilomar meeting, which was held in the 1970s when people first learned how to splice DNA, and they were worried about that. Um, was that too powerful? Would that be dangerous? And so they, they kind of cooled off for a second. They had a meeting and, and discussed it. So this, this meeting in California was sort of in Asilomar 3, I guess because it was in Asilomar 2, two yeah. um, about designer babies. So I had the opportunity to interview uh, Jennifer down at that time and it was very interesting because she had a very conservative point of view mm. on using this technology. In what sense? Well, I had very specific questions. Do you agree with edit? Because at that time, people had just started to edit the cells. There, was no, there still is no designer baby that we know of, but people had, were editing cells in the laboratory, cells of the germline. Could you edit an embryo? What about editing a sperm cell? What about editing an egg? And she said that she was uncomfortable with all those experiments. But that, that, to me, that has turned out to be a kind of a dissenting view, a view that biochemists might hold. Because once the technology was picked up by cell biologists,
by hmm. people in the fertility business, by people who are interested in changing uh, the genomes of mammals, her, her view was kind of shunted to the side. They couldn't accept, this is my, this is my reading of it, Sam, you can jump in, but I don't think that they could accept her conservative point of view, which is don't edit s cells of the germline. For these other scientists, no, this is a freedom of speech issue. This is what they, they do. These are the cells that they work with. Um, so I've seen over, this, over the intervening two years, um, her voice get sort of pulled along um, into, by the scientific mainstream into a position which is much more liberal um, as far as germline editing. You know, the, the when you say liberal, maybe another person would say more adventurous. Uh, more it could be adventurous, yeah. liberal, accepting. I mean, just the reactions to the papers when people edit an embryo, they went mm -hmm. from sort of horror to sort of, oh, that's interesting, to, wow, very exciting. Isn't that the you know, nature over, of, isn't yeah. that the arc of science in the 20th century and 21st century? Well, we'll never do that. We don't know how to do it anyway. Why are you bringing it up? Oh, well, but, but hey, now look how cool this could be. You it, may, know? it may be that scientists never really, you know, they didn't have to tell their true opinions because it wasn't possible. It was very convenient. Mm -hmm. You could mm -hmm. say, oh, no, you know, we never want to do that. But as soon as it becomes possible, then you, then you have to expose your, your true view about whether it should be done or not. There's good reasons to do it. There's plenty of reasons not. Mm -hmm. I think it's interesting that Sam and Jennifer took probably the most cautious position amongst mainstream you know, university biologists, I would say. Mm, I don't know if I agree with that. Who practicing scientists. I would say the viewpoint in the book you agree with? is actually very much in line with what the National Academies have recommended in their report from last year. I mean, we basically conclude in scenarios where if it's proven safe in preclinical work and animal models, and you have scenarios where parents cannot otherwise conceive a healthy child free of genetic disease, that would be a justifiable use for CRISPR or any gene editing approach. That's what we say in the book, and mm -hmm. that's exactly what the National Academies recommended in their, in their very lengthy and exhaustive report from last year. So I, I agree, I think the, the um, attitude in that white paper in science, I mean, although we did very explicitly separate research applications of CRISPR in germline cells, meaning it could be sperm or it could be embryos, but that are not being implanted for pregnancy as opposed to clinical uses. And even in that report, although it's often described as um, proposing a moratorium on any germline editing, if you actually read it, I mean, we really just said there should be, you know, it's not safe at all yet to think about clinical uses, but research uses was kind of put on a separate, in a mm -hmm. separate bucket. Um, mm -hmm. I do think I would agree that maybe my own opinions, but maybe Jennifer's, maybe the opinions of people at that meeting was certainly more cautious in 20, um, what was that, 2015, in the first part of the year, than by the end of the year, than certainly by 2016 when that um, National Academies report came out. So let me just turn this around for a second. We're an audience here of, of pretty much the core audience here of, of uh, uh, beginning science journalists. Um, we're at the outset of our careers. We're looking at this very important story that in one way or another is going to occupy, you know, a considerable portion of the energy of our craft for Lord knows how long going forward. Um, where, and this is a question for both of you, where do I, at the beginning of my experience with this, jump into the middle of what surely, whatever we think of the, of the patents or the designer babies or whatever, is one of the most intricate and complicated stories, both scientifically, emotionally, and in a kind of political regulatory sense. I mean, where would I begin? How would I do that? You mean like what sources would you go to? Yeah, or? yeah. Well, listen, I mean, the best advice I could Give would be to just jump right in the middle. All right, I'll read the oh, book and then I'll say what do I do. Jump straight okay, into the no. middle. And, no. you know, go but what is that? No, but I mean, so literally, so I jump in the straight in the middle. What do I do? I call Sam. I do. I go to uh, uh, whatever the patent equivalent of you know Edgar is. I mean, the online database. I yeah. mean, literally, what would you do as a step one, step two, step three, step four to bring yourself up to speed? Um. 
read the acknowledgments section of scientific papers and sort of where the funding comes from is often <laughs> the biggest tip off, I guess, is, is stuff in there. But seriously, the, the story keeps evolving and mutating. It keeps getting bigger. And we've seen from previous stories, you know, the story of DNA, previous technologies, DNA sequencing, cloning embryonic stem cells. I mean, the, the kind of the story arc goes on for decades, right? And going for two decades. People are still talking about it, it's still in the news. Um, so it's just going to continue, is, is one thing. And then, you know, the story gets more complex and goes in different directions. We have someone here from Gizmodo that has, you know, they've created a beat just on sort of DIY biohacking, which yeah. often involves CRISPR. So, yeah. um, you know, they jumped in with a kind of Gizmodo style, you know, said we're going to write about the biohackers. Um, so there's, you know, so many ways to uh, approach it. My, my own advice, advice is to actually read the scientific papers um, to get familiar with sort of the details. That's where I start. What would you do, Sam? I mean, I, I have this a version of the same problem just in my day-to-day -day life because I, you know, I get Google alerts in my inbox for CRISPR. I get PubMed alerts. PubMed is a database that many researchers use to keep track of the scientific literature. And it used to be that you know, CRISP articles with CRISPR in the title or abstract would come in a slow crawl, maybe one or two a day, maybe, but usually like a few a week. And now, I mean, I'm inundated with 10 or 15, and it's, it's tempting to try to like figure out everything that's going on. And I think one downside of having been involved with the book is that I like to keep tabs on what's going on with CRISPR well outside of what my own lab is gonna do, but just because I'm interested and I feel invested in what's being done in preclinical work for therapeutics or what's being done in agriculture. I mean, these are topics that I have way more interest in now than I did five years ago because I was able to expand my horizons a little bit by trying to put my work in the lab and Jennifer's work from the lab into a much bigger context and to see that there are big issues that this all plays into. So I, so that doesn't answer your question, but I, it's, it is difficult because there's just, it's exploding and it's, it's hard to keep track of everything. Um, I mean, yeah, the scientific literature is great. I, I try to catalog review articles because that, I mean, those bring together dozens of articles and then you can find out where you want to put your time in hunting down primary literature. I mean, frankly, I, I read every MIT tech review piece that comes out. Not, I mean, really, I, I have it on my Twitter feed and I find Twitter very useful for, for CRISPR things. I think I have a very good set of followers that point me in very interesting directions that I just wouldn't come across Hmm. because I don't have time to look at all these different outlets, but with Twitter, with folks like Antonio, Antonio and, and other scientists and other journalists, I mean, that's like, that's been a fantastic feed for me to keep tabs on what's going on, honestly. Okay. Professor Fagan, you seem uh, pregnant with curiosity. I am. I'm very pregnant. Uh, so it's interesting that you both emphasize the primary literature when, when Lee asked, how do I get caught up on this? The, the classic response would be, well, I read the secondary literature. You know, I, I, I look at what's been published in, you know, quality journalistic outlets. And, and Sam mentioned that at the, at the end, uh, citing Antonio's work. But I wonder if, in general, the fact that neither of you talk much about that is that you really don't think much of the coverage, hmm. the, 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 the lay the coverage for lay audiences so far. And if that's true, like what, what's the problem? What, what do you see that you don't like in most journalism about hmm. CRISPR-Cas9 in general and about you know, human germline work specifically? Are, are, is, there, is there too much gee whiz and not enough oh my god or is it vice versa? Or what, what do you see that the people in this room we could learn from and, and do better in, in, in the current journalism on this topic. Yeah, Antonio, why don't you take a? Yeah, that was a long question. Um, yeah. So, so, <laughs> so, so what, what do we? What, no, what are we? Do, what are we this doing is, wrong? Is a, what are we doing wrong here? We you read the Wall Street Journal and you want to wad it up and throw it at the well, wall. Well, two years late. I mean, what can I tell you? <laughs> Science, science. Uh, this is a, we've convened science reporters here. I actually don't consider myself a science reporter. I consider myself a technology reporter. But, but technologies, they have, just happen to be the biotechnology. Okay, <laughs> so 
just like um, you can imagine TechCrunch, there's all these magazines about technology and we care about every little thing that Google does and every little step that Apple takes and every personnel move because um, you know, we use those technologies in our everyday life and so we're curious about them and you know, they touch us. The, the, the thing about CRISPR is it doesn't, you know, for the man on the street, it doesn't yet matter. You know, it doesn't mm -hmm. affect anybody's life. So it's still the sort of specialized information, right? Hmm. People just don't need it. Okay. They don't need it. That's why the patent story certainly got a lot of play because, you know, it's just a fight. So, you know, you just, just like slowing your car down on the highway. It's true. You know, it's just yeah. something to, to look at. Um, so I think it makes it hard to, you know, because it, it doesn't affect people's lives, it makes it hard um, to bring to, to a wide audience. I mean, people do it, of course. Um, you know, they write profiles of people and they say how mm -hmm. important this technology is, it's kind of world changing. Um, but how many times can you say that? Um, I'm lucky enough to work in a magazine that's sort of, sort of public facing, sort of a trade magazine, and so I can kind of, you know, uh, play the difference between those. Um, so that's my answer. They want you to criticize the, the press coverage, but you, which you should. Well, let's put it this way. You should do it. We're offering you an opportunity. Yeah. <laughs> let's hear what it sounds like. I don't have, I don't have criticisms. I mean, I, you know, I think I absolutely agree. It, it's a challenge to, to talk about the promise of CRISPR when the, the truth is that any therapies using CRISPR are, I mean, what, five, ten years out, maybe? And you can look back at, at gene therapy as, which, I mean, came up before I was in science, so you, either of you would be able to comment better than I would, but I mean, at least reading back on news stories from the, the 90s and the early 2000s, I mean, this was going to be the holy grail of, of a different kind of medicine, and where are the breakthrough drugs? I mean, we've got now the first couple examples of commercialized gene therapy drugs. We can, we can debate about what's the first one or not. I know that's another thing mm -hmm. that I yeah. enjoyed <laughs> seeing on your, your Twitter feed. Um, but, you know, I think, is there a risk of instilling too much hope by saying this is the end to genetic disease with CRISPR? I mean, it's, and I often say, in terms of eradicating mutations in a Petri dish, that's just old hat now. It's easy. But doing that inside of a patient is a completely different ballgame, and I think that's not going to be easy, and that's going to be a, a long, arduous process, not to mention, you know, how expensive are these therapies going to be? And, and I think, yes, of course, you have some articles that make this seem all like a walk in the park and it's already done, and that's just not the truth. Well, we are purveyors of hope, yes? I mean, being hopeful is good, and I think... Yeah. What's your favorite CRISPR-Cas9 media cliche? Um, in terms of, like, metaphors for talking about it, or... Uh, I actually have started to use Hank Greeley's metaphor of the Model T a couple times. You've probably heard Hank mm -hmm. use this. So the lawyer and, and bioethicist at Stanford, and he describes CRISPR as kind of the Model T in that it's not the first gene editing technology out there, like the Model T wasn't the first car, but it was one of the first ones that was really mass produced and cheap enough that anyone could really mm -hmm. have this. So, and I so think you, like, you like that one? I do, I think it's very yeah. apt. I mean, I right. think for researchers, again, I didn't come from a gene editing background. I, I came from CRISPR, yeah. but I mean, before CRISPR, I, I know we, we mentioned an anecdote in the book of, of a colleague of Jennifer's at Berkeley who was using this previous technology called VFNs, and it was too complicated to build themselves, so they were spent, you know, I think they got a deal with Sangamo, which is a company in, in California for reduced pricing, but they were gonna be like $20,000 for a single version of a ZFN, and th that's a multi-month process to build them and to use it, and now you can screen thousands of different versions of CRISPR in a week yeah. for like, a hundred bucks, but mm -hmm. you can make a library of guide mm -hmm. RNAs and right. test them all in an array or a mm -hmm. pooled screen, and you know, anyone with a molecular biology background can pretty much do this experiment now. So that's that's uh, that's really a game changer. So that's what makes it the Model T. It yeah. comes in one color, but everybody can afford it. You have a question? Yes, um, I actually want to go back to the primary literature that you guys were discussing earlier. And uh, what I wanted to ask was that if you do look at the acknowledgement sections, you often find that scientists who are working on applications of genetic technology often have conflicts of interest. 
mm -hmm. um, because it is such a small community still. So I was wondering how to uh, deal with that as a reporter especially, or how Antonio deals with that as a reporter. How do you take into account people's conflicts of interest? How should you take them into account, Antonio? Right, well actually, so the conflicts are not um, scrupulously disclosed, nope. right? Sometimes they're disclosed yeah. and sometimes they aren't. Um, it came up in this famous uh, episode where Eric Lander, the head of the Broad Institute, wrote an editorial in Cell, sort Classic. of telling his own story and he was about CRISPR, and he was cast as the bad guy trying to warp the narrative, and people pointed out that he didn't have a um, disclosure, a financial disclosure, um, disclosing that the Broad Institute had all these patents, but in fact he'd filed one, um, and they hadn't used it. And oh, then, really? Oh, I didn't yeah, know that. And then in the same issue of Cell, Jennifer Doudna had her own um, huh. uh, review article, which was very technical, but it also lacked a disclosure. Um, so it was interesting, you know, neither side of the dispute bothered to disclose, uh, yeah. you know, the, of course there's a million dollars um, at stake. Um, I just as long as we're on the, on the subject oh, thank of, you. Yeah. of new sources, we have Kevin Davies in the audience, and yes. he's the, I guess, the founding editor of the CRISPR Journal, so um, there's now a home, I suppose, just to plug this for uh, new. No, absolutely, I was going to point it out. You know, people, people, I have a copy of this, yeah. so someone can grab mine if they want to, you know, start their journey into CRISPR, this, this opening issue. Well, uh, if, is, if we had any question about the legitimacy of CRISPR as a career-making field of inquiry, the fact that it now has its own journal um, <laughs> should uh, put any doubts to rest. And one of my favorite, can I just mention a favorite anecdote? I wish you would. Yeah, what's okay. your favorite CRISPR? Well, this uh, is one that hasn't ca caught on, but I'll, I'll tell you. <laughs> <laughs> well, then Sa it's probably uh, still useful. Th th this actually an helps answer the, the, the person's question and um, also picks up where Sam led off about how CRISPR is distributed around the world. It's distributed in different ways, but particularly from a company called AdGene. It's kind of a nonprofit mm -hmm. company in, in Cambridge, and the scientists can submit their DNA strands, sort of in bacteria, I guess, to this group, and then and then they, they, they literally have a mail room, and in the morning there's these interns picking up these packages, sending the CRISPR all over the world, uh, to Brazil, to India, uh, not to North Korea, apparently, <laughs> um, and it costs sixty dollars, so you can you can kind of get into the CRISPR business for sixty bucks. In fact, you could probably order it to your house. Whether you can do anything with it is, is a different matter, and so. Something that came up in the sort of the acknowledgement section of, of the first paper in which the Chinese edited human embryos, mm. I went down, you know, I read the abstract and then I go straight to the acknowledgements. And the acknowledgements said, we, we want to thank Adgene for selling us this CRISPR, you know, for selling us the, the reagent to do this controversial experiment on human embryos. And so the cliche that has not caught on is that um, it's like the, the, the visa ad. The cost of CRISPR is $60, mm. and editing the human germline, priceless. <laughs> you see why? It's kind of, it's sort of a tortured <laughs> yeah, it uh, is thing, the, but, but I thought but it was- You gotta work on it. I think <laughs> the, delivery, work on the delivery needs a little bit of work. Yeah, yeah. maybe a headline in there somewhere, yeah. I don't know. Um, uh, it was a footnote to a paper, but I thought uh -huh. it was very interesting. You know, this kind of world-changing thing. They paid $60 by mail order to get it. One of the interesting things about this technology is its democratizing effects. Uh, you mentioned the uh, do-it-yourself biohacking, mm -hmm. and now we can uh, mail order even if we're uh, in China or another country uh, that may or may not be subject to export controls. Um, how does this affect how we ought to be thinking about this as journalists. Should we just be looking at the big institutions or should we as reporters be a little bit more broad-minded? As reporters? Um, yeah, yeah there's a lot of coverage now of the do-it-yourself uh, biologists. I kind of made the comment on Twitter the other day that this should now go over to the media desk and not the science desk because a lot of these uh, DIY experiments are just kind of spectacular things to get attention. There's not really that much uh, science in there, but it's something to watch because what they're talking about is, is they're, they're kind of advocating this point of view that you know, anybody should be able to, to do gene editing. Anybody should be able to modify you know, the thread of life. And I'm pretty comfortable when someone like Sam is doing it because he spent a long time in school and he's been indoctrinated. He's part of 
you know, this culture, um, and he's got a career in science to think about. Um, but I'm less comfortable, honestly, when it's somebody, uh, a millennial, which is already scary, you know, um, yeah, that's a nice. who, who, has not, who is not part of the guild of science and is playing with this stuff. You know? That, that, I don't think that that's that great an idea. What's the next big story, Sam? Where's this going? Well, I'm reminded of the first time we met when actually one of the first things you told me was if I told you, what were the, what were the words you used? If I told you that there was like a huge secret that I couldn't tell you, what do you think it would be? Do you remember this? Mm -hmm. You were alluding to some crazy story. You couldn't tell me what it was, but you wanted me to guess at what it might be. Mm -hmm. and. And I feel like at some point I thought maybe that story came out, or maybe that's still a story, or it's not a story anymore. But as an aside, I'm quite curious okay. if you can comment on that. <laughs> I mean, of course, coming back to the, this question of germline editing, so the, one of the most recent papers that got covered very widely in the media and in the scientific world was from a, a research group in Oregon that did, um, that used CRISPR in human embryos to a much higher level of efficiency with, according to their analyses, you know, little to no off-target effects. There have been some questions raised since then about if their analyses would have really caught some of the off-target effects based on the way they were doing the DNA sequence analysis. But at the surface, I mean, I think it's becoming clear that whereas, like Antonio said earlier, 10 years ago, you could kind of just be against germline editing and you didn't have to justify it because it wasn't possible anyway. That time has come and gone. Um, so of course, I'm left wondering, when is it going to be, a, when will there be a pregnancy that's resulted from the use of CRISPR? And maybe it's already happened. I mean, people often love to throw China under the bus and say, of course, it's gonna happen in China and maybe they're already doing it. Um, I'm not saying that's true, but you know, I think people are concerned that there might be areas with less regulatory structures in place where this could be going on. I often mention the story of actually a fertility doctor in New York City who um, was one of the first people to knowingly use this three-parent IVF approach, um, mitochondrial replacement therapy. Mm -hmm. And from what I understand, the actual molecular um, I mean, the injection or the, the nuclear extraction and the um, replacement inside of an enucleated egg that was carried out in New York, but the implantation into the, into the mother was done in Mexico, specifically to avoid the fact that this would have need, needed to have been approved by the FDA to be done in the US. So I think that brings up this concern over medical tourism and the fact that, you know, mm -hmm. even if it's not legal here, there could be doctors using the cutting, you know, the most cutting edge approaches and then just simply flying somewhere where there aren't any laws about it. Well, you know, it's interesting and I want to get your thoughts. When cloning first became possible as a technique in higher mammals, you know, um, there was just, I mean, the world was consumed with stories for a period of some years of cloning human is just right around the corner and we really need to be worrying about this. Um, uh, and yet with, with the, the perspective of some time, it turns out that the thing we needed to worry about was Barbara Streisand cloning her dog. Um, and that the real utility of cloning and its ramification would turn out to have like absolutely nothing to do with that fear that consumed us for so many years. And is it the case now, Antonio, that we're just scaring ourselves and that actually the real utility and perhaps the real uh, danger of CRISPR-Cas9 lies elsewhere? I was author of a lot of those cloning stories. I um, feel confident you did. Yeah, but in fact, and so actually with the scientists were arguing in favor of human cloning in, in one way they wanted to do this thing called therapeutic cloning. They said we have to make identical cells to Sam and we can only do it by taking Sam's skin and putting it in somebody's egg and making embryonic stem cells. And so there was a kind of global lobbying battle over that fantastic technology. Mm -hmm. So not only was the human reproductive cloning 
apparently, we don't know that it's happened, apparently that was a kind of a dead end. But also the technology that the scientists were advocating for and taking up brain space with was a complete uh, dead end. And people kind of knew it then. And a different way of well. making uh, of stem cells came along. IPCs. Right, a better, so. a better mm -hmm. way, a better mm -hmm. way. So, um, you know, Sam said before, it's not just CRISPR-Cas9, now it's CRISPR-XYZ. Um, we're, we're just gonna have better ways. So we take the story that we have today, it's CRISPR, it's a sort of simplistic patent fight, it's the characters that we know about, Jennifer Doudna, Feng Zhang, Sam, and, and we're trying to get a hold and understand where biology is through this lens. That's why we pick it up. It tells, it's an, it's an opportunity to talk about where biology is. Tomorrow the lens is gonna be something else. Cloning, CRISPR, something else, but the trajectory is clear. The trajectory is, you know, control over biology through the genome. Kind of modular control, total control. And that's what this book is about too. That's very scary to have that kind of control. Because that, I mean, we're talking about life itself. And then we're talking about democratizing the control. So any troll can have it. Think about it. I am speechless. Yeah. Unusual state. So then, given your perceptive analysis, what is the next story? <laughs> for you, for you, what is the next story? Uh, um, the next CRISPR story? Sure. <coughs> I can't say what it is. It's actually, we'll, we'll talk about it later. It's actually, there's a couple of stories that, that I don't think have been told for, for a we're while. Not, so we're I not going to tell anybody. No, no, <laughs> no, no. No, it's a great temptation to reveal something. I'm sure scientists have the same temptation to tell uh, your next idea, and I, I won't do it. But um, you know, what's been interesting about CRISPR for me is actually led me back to gene therapy. Really? And I think it primed all of journalism to, to, to pay attention to gene therapy again, because we're writing about CRISPR, and suddenly this older technology, 20 years old now, is finally reaching the place where it's curing people. So we also have now that suddenly the demonstration of just Lazarus-like cures. You know, people are being cured of hemophilia in one dose. This is through a virus that just adds a gene to their genome. CRISPR is sort of gene therapy 2.0. We're not gonna see those treatments for a while yet. But for, for me at least, you know, I'm writing less about CRISPR, now I'm writing more about this older technology, gene therapy, and how it's arriving um, in the marketplace. And we have someone here from the Washington Post. They've done a great job also of covering uh, sort of the arrival of gene therapy. It's also a regulatory question uh, with the FDA approving these treatments. So um, sort of past his prologue or something. Mm -hmm. So I want to end with a discussion of just briefly now of being a public scientist. You have, um, for better or for worse, knowingly or unknowingly, um, stepped out of the lab and stepped into this, whatever you want to call this. Um, you know, in the past, um, scientists have talked about there being penalties to being embraced in this, that there's a career cost, that other scientists don't like it. Um, uh, I'm wondering whether you have any idea yet whether that's true, and if it is true, is it worth the ability to speak directly to the public? about something this important? Um, I haven't had any real experiences where it's, where I've felt like I've paid a price for having written the book. I also feel extremely fortunate and excited that I have this new gig at Columbia. And I mean, I think for my future, I'm certainly retreating a bit from these kinds of events, or at least trying to really stay focused on the lab because I'm not going to be, like, I, I want to be known for my science and not for having been in Jennifer's lab when CRISPR was happening. You know, I want to, even if it's not a name like Jennifer's, I'd like to make my name for, for the research coming out of my future group. And, and frankly, I mean, what inspired me to come back to academia was the, the time I spent mentoring people in Jennifer's lab, um, my time at this company, my, my years where I was teching at Columbia. You know, I love working with students, um, undergrads, grad students. I love working with other colleagues, and it's just all that joy is coming back to me being back at Columbia. Um, so 
I think I feel very um, lucky that I could take this year off and come back to science in exactly the way that I dreamed about when I was first starting research in the lab as an undergrad. Um, but I also, I have to say, I value the opportunity to speak more often with non-scientists. So for example, when I was writing the book for a year, I camped out of my folks' place for a month or so in Pennsylvania, and my dad was a, a teacher at Franklin and Marshall College, and um, one of his colleagues invited me to give a talk. They have a kind of a week, a monthly common hour where the entire undergrad campus is invited to come hear a, a speaker talk about something that is both in their you know, area of expertise, but also has some kind of societal implications. And that was one of the funnest talks that I prepared. I met with a class before that, talked about some of these issues we're talking about tonight. And for me, that's, that's a, an experience that, you know, I, I guess I forgot about that bigger picture part of education and science when I was spending 12 hour days in the lab going after my first big paper by kind of you know having this tunnel vision and putting everything else outside and so in an ideal world for myself and I think for the people that I'll work with in the lab I think straddling cutting-edge research and also spending time outside of that world mentoring educating science outreach I think if we mm -hmm. can do both that's that's what I want to keep doing do you think he has the freedom to speak honestly about his work? About his scientific work? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I think so. <laughs> I, don't, I don't have any reason not to think so, sure. He's a chemist, so I don't, I don't, I don't even think about chemistry. It's too complex. I stick to the genome. It's sort of easier to picture in my mind. Do you, do you have your doubts, or? Well, I remind you that, that we began this conversation by setting some boundary constraints that you operated under, you know, the idea that you were perhaps uh, attached to one player in this dispute, and depending on what, how well one knew you or didn't know you as a journalist, know your work, that one might look askance at his coverage and say, well, this is really, you know, coming from this way. And in the same way, um, in order to, I don't know about the second half of this book, but certainly the first half of this book, um, a, uh, an attorney pursuing a, a patent challenge could have a field day with a very careful account of, uh, of how this particular discovery came to be. Um, and it's constrained. It's constrained by legal considerations. Yeah. Um, so I'm that's the framework, or but that's the, the context in which I ask this question. I appreciate that in this arena, you have the opportunity to spread your wings as far as you want and say what you think, but in the world of research, of discovery, of priority, perhaps you're more constrained. That's where we started. So but in that that's world, why I asked the question at yeah, the end. In that world, I'm a scientist and I go off my research and my data and if my experimental data support my, I mean, it's, it's just a different language and it's not about the priority is about do I have interesting science and the, the results and the interpretation that does support it. So I, th I think that's very actually quite different. I do think, I mean, it's interesting what is the real history of CRISPR? Is there a history? I mean, I've seen Fung give talks that, that don't mention Jennifer when he talks about his um, origin story for CRISPR and frankly, it could be totally true. I mean, I, that guy is brilliant, and there was a very clear path to thinking about using these systems for gene editing that didn't necessarily need to go through a biochemical understanding of how Cas9 works, because there was a lot of genetic evidence, and one could use that information to design experiments and still arrive at the modern day version of the tool. So, but that, is not to say, I mean, there are many people that might view Jennifer and Emmanuel as the co-inventors because the way that they learned about CRISPR was reading her paper. Um, so even though there may have been another pioneer that had his own path to developing some of the tools that are probably the most commonly requested plasmas on that gene, um, there are plenty of people that experienced or were introduced and entered this field through a different narrative altogether. And then, of course, there are other stories about other scientists that are ignored even more often, like Virginia Justixness, who, you know, 
had this casualty of, of submitting a paper to a different journal and it could have come out before Jennifer and Emmanuel's and it came out later and you know so there is I don't think there is a everyone has a bias based on their own experience there is no one true history and um, I think what's been interesting for me my view of the science I've read about in other disciplines I mean I like reading a lot of science nonfiction and I'm realizing there's got to be a story like this behind most things and what I end up learning, I mean, if I'm going to read one book about, if I'm going to just read Jim Watson's book or just read The Eighth Day of Creation, well, hell, that's going to be my, my understanding. I don't have time to read every book. I don't have time to go back to the, to the 50s and read everything that was published about who did what, and, and you end up getting the slice of history based on the sources you have time to read. Um, so. I, I'm not making a real point. I guess I'm just no. You're describing the <laughs> you're describing the plight of the journalist for sure. We we come to this with what we think is uh, well, not the truth necessarily. Who knows what that is? But you know our collection of facts. I mean, Antonio. I mean, yes, and that shapes our worldview of a situation. Your your understanding of this has evolved, has it not? Uh, it has, it has. I mean, for me, it was sort of like Trump Russia before it was Trump Russia. It was just the CRISPR story. It was that complex. It was that had that had that many moving parts. And I think in my own case, just to echo what Sam said, um, was a developing acknowledgement that actually many people were reaching the same destination, the same truth about the world and biology at the same time on different paths. And so then when, if it's a dispute about who got there first or who really is the inventor of it, of course it was invented by nature, who discovered it maybe, um, that all these stories are true at the same time. Hmm. Um, so as a journalist, that's the most interesting thing is to, you know, to learn about you know, how many paths to CRISPR. Maybe someone will write a book, you know, the nine paths to CRISPR. And if you, and you take anyone out, and I think we're still where we are today. Maybe maybe we're there in a year from now or six months from now, but this is not one of those discoveries where I think, well, maybe that's not, I mean, you could say, well, no, I think we would have gotten here at some point anyway. I mean, you could go much further back with CRISPR. I think if CRISPR hadn't been studied by, let's say, Rodolf Berengau and Philippe Horvath or Mojica, I mean, certainly I think to get enough uh, uh, critical mass research in CRISPR, that was important and that could have stalled us getting to where we are, but I think from the 2010s onwards, we're going to get to the same point, even if you pluck Jennifer out of the picture, or Emmanuel, yeah. or, or Fung, or George, or Prashant Mal, any of these so people. Do you agree with, with that? With the, um, not to put you on the spot. To pluck people out of the story? Do we still get to the same yeah, but, rough yeah, end point? Yeah, potentially. I mean, um, and yeah, that's not probably. to minimize anyone's work. I just think, like you were just saying, I mean, many people were working towards working towards this point. I think. Right. It's a, it's also an interesting moment for journalism and for book authors. Just as Sam said, I mean, these books are coming out now, and we're not all going to go back to you know the footnotes. We're going to read the books that were written. And those are going to tell the story. So, um, you know, I think a kind of a decisive stroke by Sam and Jennifer yeah. to have written to the first book, and then we'll see a, a uh, preemptive strike. You mentioned Michael Spector's book uh, up, upcoming, and one from Jay Shirkow on the patent thing. So, you know, the, these are the people that were drawn to this story, uh, have already been active writing about it on Twitter, and and, and you know, it's quite interesting to to think that uh, there's a couple of journalists, a couple of scientists, and a patent attorney who are the ones that are going to be, you know writing the first, at least book-length editions. Hmm. Um, hmm. Yeah. Well, so you leave us here with many stories becoming one, and the likelihood of that one story that we'll have going forward, of it actually being true, I mean, in some kind of uber-historical sense, it's actually, it's beginning to sound is rather low. <laughs> right, and it, and it actually gets back to something you mentioned at the beginning, Nobel Prize. The Nobel Prize, we're going to talk about, we can talk about whether there can be a Nobel Prize for CRISPR in a second, but the Nobel, the Nobel um, Committee tends to wait until things get settled down. Because they don't, talking about plucking people out of the story, a Nobel Prize only goes to three people. 
Indeed. And right now we have a cast of you know a dozen. Um, we're going to have to pare that down, or they're going to have to pare that down. So, you know, people always prognosticate there's going to be a, a Nobel Prize for CRISPR um, next year. If they do it, it'll be a political decision on their part, um, like when they gave Obama the, the Peace Prize or something. You know, it's kind of too. I think it's too soon. It's got to settle down. And the other thing, what's interesting, what I found most interesting about this book is, is it opens up with a chapter about a guy named Mario Capecci, who actually invents gene editing. Gene uh, targeting, but well, yeah, sure. Okay, fine. Gene targeting, uh, you know, 30 years ago, and has already won the Nobel Prize for it. There's already a Nobel Prize for, for gene editing. On that note, with the question of the Nobel Prize safely settled, <laughs> well, wait, let me thank you both for taking us uh, on an interesting walk through one of the most complicated uh, technical stories of our time, both from the inside and from the outside. Thank you both very, very much. Now I hope that uh, you might, if there's any beer left or glass beer left or glass beer left or glass beer left or glass.